Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining Tech Talk Tuesday. This is Ad Mirza, Principal Architect with Aviatrix. Today, we have very experienced Aviatrix Customer Solutions Architect, Andy Long, who will be discussing the use cases, challenges running BGP in the cloud, and how network engineers and architects should be designing the cloud environment with BGP. We are going to dive into this session, but if you are new to Aviatrix, then you can join Aviatrix Office Hours, which is every week. For more information, you can check the link in the chat. With that, it's uh, all you, Andy. Hey, thank you, Saad. Thank you for inviting me for Tech Talk Tuesday. Uh, this is Andy Leung. Like uh, Saad said, I'm the customer solution architect. So today I'm going to talk about um, the different option to distribute route using BGP into the cloud. Some of the challenges of using BGP you know, in the native construct, and in the end, how aviatric software-defined networking help enhance route distribution and programming and give you the visibility uh, into that environment. So before we begin going into the cloud, right, I want to talk about where most of us, you know, more familiar with today. Um, BGP was a protocol that started in the 90s. And in that time, there was really no cloud at all. It was designed you know, for the internet in mind and maybe some on-prem uh, usage, right? So most of the customers that I deal with today, uh, when they talk about BGP, they primarily have three usage for it. You know, one is connect to the internet to exchange routing information so they can reach the internet at large. Um, some customer, they might have their private MPLS connection from one of the service provider like AT&T and Verizon, and they use BGP to redistribute their IGP protocol like EIGRP OSPF into the environment so they have visibility throughout their whole network. And the third one I see sometimes is that they might have partner where they want to dynamically exchange routing protocol with that partner. Right, and provide a level of resiliency. So typically, these are the different use cases I see um, today with most of my customer. Uh, however, when we talk about BGP in the cloud, it's a little bit different, right? Like I was mentioning earlier, the protocol came about in the mid 90s and there was no cloud, right? And some of the challenges um, different things that, that you be, should be aware of um, as it related to cloud. Um, so uh, let me give you an example here. So in this example, I have you know, multiple cloud service provider with different region, and I might have different location I want to connect and talk to the cloud, right? It could be an on-prem location, it could be a co-location, you know, like Equinix, or it could be a partner. And I break this diagram up into three different uh, sections, if you will. Um, and talk of, so at the bottom low, most layer, you know, in terms of just distributing, using BGP to distribute route into the cloud environment. Uh, obviously, uh, all these different cloud provider support BGP as a way to exchange routing information. But Many of these provider, in fact, all of them have some limitation one way or the other. For example, right, um, in AWS, you can only distribute 100 routes from your on-prem or any location within a, appearing to the cloud environment. So 100 is not a lot, right? Um, the other thing is that they, these constructs are also very basic in the sense that if you were to want to use some of the attribute that are native to BGP, right? Like ad path, um, not ad path, I mean, ASN, right? You want to AS prepend. So there's very little option in doing that. While you can do AS prepend when you advertise to the cloud provider, the opposite is not true. Right, there's no really mechanism for you to manipulate those attributes. Now, one of the big concepts going to the cloud is also 
this concept of zero trust, right? Because now your traffic is no longer confined within your enterprise. You know, even if you were to, you know, subscribe to Direct Connect, that connection or those routers that provide the connections are shared entity. So if you were to prescribe to zero trust where you want everything to be encrypted as soon as it leaves your premise, you have to do some kind of encryption, most popular IPsec. When you have a direct connect or some kind of dedicated connection to the cloud provider, that may be 10 gig, right? Um, when you enable encryption, a lot of time, that whole 10 gig bandwidth that you purchase are no longer available because of the constraint related to IPsec they have. Typically, it could go down to 1.25 gigabit. Um, that's the most you can pass to for a single IPsec tunnel because even though you might have a 10 gig connection, right? Um, also, in terms of traffic engineering, a little bit of that, ECMP, if you have multiple connection, there is also very limited option in how you can benefit from using those so multiple connection. Going one level higher, right? Once you get the route into the cloud environment, again, there is no concept of really traffic engineering and how you direct that traffic. Um, Sometimes also, you know, in case of a partner, they might also have a overlapping IP overlapping CIDR, meaning you already use that CIDR range inside your VPC, but it just happened that your partner that you actually bring in also use that same CIDR. Now, in the native construct, um, you could solve it, but it requires you to add additional resource, for example, like a NAT gateway or NAT instance, right? Another piece of resource that you need to manage and orchestrate into the overall environment. Lastly, once you get the route past all that, there's yet another level that you need to consider. For example, um, we talk about how many routes you can exchange via BTP, but at the VPC level, there's also limitation on how many route entry you can put in there, right? Uh, for BGP advertising route, again, you know, in AWS, they have the limit of 100. You know, you cannot exceed that. If you exceed that, those routes are just not going to get programmed. You're not going to get reachability. Only the very simple way of programming route table is available. What does that mean? If you have, let's say you advertise a route to your environment, and it's okay for that route to be programmed in all the subnet routing table or the VPC routing table, that's fine, right? That's very easily done. However, uh, many large enterprises, even within a single VPC, they might have multiple subnets and they might not want the route to be programmed to all those subnets. They might want to program the route in certain subnet, but not the other, right? So when you need to do that, that require a lot of manual intervention. In fact, Azure called their routing table UDR, user defined routing, right? In essence, telling you that you got to put in your static route manually uh, to get those things to work, right? So there's not much of, you know, orchestration, if you will, between when you get the route advertised into the environment and programming all these routing table. Now, to add to that, we're only talking about single region here. If you have multiple regions, there's another level of complexity in distributing route between east and west region within AWS. You have to add additional construct. You know, AWS has, has their own native construct. Azure might have a different one and GCP might have yet their own. So just distributing route within a cloud provider, you know, require additional work. Now that is not to say, not cover, if you have multiple cloud provider, right? A lot of people don't just use Azure or AWS, they use two or three, sometimes four. 
different cloud provider. How do you distribute a route to all those different providers, right? One way is that you just have peering session to all of them, right? Now, but then that comes into the cloud, you need additional resource to uh, provision those routes, right? Additional um, intervention in managing those routes. The other thing that is also different is that not all cloud providers support um, the same type of connections, like for example, in AWS support BGP over GRE. Um, in Azure and GCP, it does not support that construct, right? So some customer might say, well, I don't worry about that too much. I really only use one single cloud environment. It doesn't matter if AWS or GCP, but I only use one, right? Then those things I don't really don't have to worry about. Well, what I see is that some, maybe not all, still applies to them, right? For example, you know, company might have merger and acquisition. They might merge with another company that result in overlapping CIDA, right? So that, that still could come up where you need to augment your environment with this general construct to manage that overlapping CIDA. You could have a large number of prefixes that you need to advertise. Right, especially some of these bigger organizations that they have been around for a while, they have their own class B network actually. Um, and they are not RFC 1918 subnet. And that's important because you cannot summarize these non RFC 1918 route because when you summarize it, it masks those addresses in between that you might have to reach on the internet, right? So um, large number of prefixes Again, like we talked about earlier, not only are they, you cannot summarize it, but you just may not be able to pass that many route prefixes into the environment. High performance encryption, right? Like we talked about that again earlier too. If you have 10 gig, you want to use 10 gigabit. You don't want to use 1.25 gigabit, right? Um, that is just, you know, silly, right? So high performance um, encryption. But also very importantly, almost all the cloud provider pride themselves in saying, we abstract the network layer for you. You don't need to worry about the networking. We do the networking for you. However, uh, what I see a lot with, you know, with my customers is that when a user having a problem reaching the application, the first person they're gonna call is not Amazon or Azure. The first person they're gonna call is the support people. And what does those support people have to do? And they have to find out what breaks. But when the CSP abstract the networking away from you, you have zero visibility. You have very limited tools you can help your user identify the problem. Unlike traditional in enterprise, you can go telnet to a router if it's a reachability, you can do ping, you can do trace route none of that or very little of that is available. Practically none. So even if you are in a single service provider, there's still a set of challenges that you, know, you have to consider, you know, when you just, how you, when you bridge the network together. <clears throat> and aviatrics help bridge that gap in the native BGP construct. Right, like we were talking about earlier, BGP was never have cloud environment design in mind, right? It's like 20 plus years ago, there was nothing. Um, I don't even think AWS was selling a uh, service yet. So there's several area that I want to cover here that we help enhance the native construct, right? Like the BGP connectivity, the performance, the control, like we're talking about how you can distribute the route to certain subnet or how you steer the traffic. The simplicity, how it gives you the, the, the single view, right? The CSP and the visibility. So the first one, right? In terms of BGP connectivity options, there are three options that we offer that allows you to connect your environment into the cloud environment. Uh, we have what we call 
BGP over LAN, I'm just calling it BGP here, basically is not encapsulated. BGP just direct peering with our um, aviatrix gateway environment. We have a, another option where you tunnel BGP inside a GRE tunnel, All right? That actually comes in pretty handy and I'll explain that a little later. And we talk about that zero trust, BGP over IPsec. And this is just not the 1.25 gig right, limitation. This is high performance IPsec, meaning even with the encryption, you can send 10 gigabit fully utilize your dedicated connection, right? High performance encryption and BGP, you know, communicating through that. In terms of performance and control, right? I just mentioned the 10 gigabit IPsec encryption. We also support a large number of routes that you can advertise via your BGP session, you know, be it to your on-premise location, your colo, doesn't matter. Instead of 100 routes that most CSP providers support, you can send in hundreds. We have customers that send in thousands, close to 10,000 routes into the environment. And that's possible with the enhancement that our platform brings in. Um, it also helps in terms of control, distribute those routes into the different region and then and then uh, uh, different IS, uh, CSP. We resolve the overlapping IP, we give you the traffic engineering. Also very important is the control in managing your cloud control plane. You can now manage your whole data, uh, control plane, right? All the routing, all the network engineering in one single place. It doesn't matter you use two cloud, three cloud, um, you actually, in certain sense, bring in your on-prem into that single plane as well. And I'll show you that later in terms of how, what we do in terms of segmentation, right? Um, we also have this concept of side notification and approval, right? A lot of time you might connect to a partner and you know it's fine when you first connect it, but let's say some time down the line, somebody want to advertise a new side and they accidentally have one digit off. They advertise as a incorrect cider into your environment, right? You don't want that to happen because potentially that could black hole traffic. So we have this concept, right, of cider notification and approval. You actually get a notification and only upon your approval, that cider would get advertised into your environment. <clears throat> and this is the other part about, you know, smart, right? We at this concept of software defined networking or programming of route table that help you orchestrate the environment. It support multiple CSP. I only show three here. We support Oracle. You could integrate, for example, um, Ali Cloud into the environment, or if you are a government entity, we support AWS Gov Cloud, and we continue to add new cloud service provider in our service offering. All that is great for day one when you turn up the network, but most importantly, what I was talking earlier is that visibility aspect, right? You no longer, when you go to the cloud, have the luxury of going to a router to do troubleshooting. Um, most of the time you rely on clicking through 10 tab, looking at uh, security group and route table we give you that visibility. Not only do we give you the visibility, we give you the tools to do that, like packet capture. Sometimes things are not working, maybe between two applications. You could actually do packet capture in the network to see potentially what those frame looks like. You know, maybe it's not formatted with the right field um, or it's not responding a certain packet. You get that visibility. And the last thing, even though it's the last thing, but I feel that is a very important piece is the the topology, you know, everybody say moving at the speed of cloud to infer how fast things move, right? And one of the hardest things I, I find, at least for even for myself, is keeping documentation up to date. And we, our platform actually has that visual view that is up to date. 
if you add a new VPC, you add a new gateway, we have that information on the view. So it's up to date. You can use it as part of documentation, right? To show people, this is what I have. So that's very important. All right, so this is enterprise grade, Andy, especially the BGP controls and then the connectivity options that every network engineer would like to have, right? Um, but I mean, I, I do have one question regarding the middle layer, which you are showing with the Aviatrix gateways. So are these global gateways that resides in their own wall gardens or can you please expand on it? Yeah, no, that's really good. I mean, I'm kind of uh, trying to keep the diagram simple. So I didn't draw that out. But what those are is that these gateway, this aviatric transit gateway actually sits inside a VPC or a VNet, right? So these are still asset in your own environment. You're not sharing anything with anybody, uh, but they are a, they sit inside a VPC um, that typically in the region that they need to talk to uh, and in the CSP that they talk to. Very, very good question. Thank you, Saad. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for clarifying it. Yeah, you're welcome. So let me go a little deeper into what I was talking about the BGP options, right? Since this session is about BGP, right? So one of the first option is BGP over LAN. So this is just pure BGP peering with no tunnel at all. Um, a lot of people find this very useful because um, you could actually, you know, instantiate gateway that you have in the cloud environment, right? And you want to exchange routing information. One of the big use cases, people have the SD-WAN gateway in the cloud instead of having it uh, at their own facility, they have the SDN gateway inside the cloud. And that's how their user, their branch, you know, um, talk to each other via that SD-WAN construct. And they need to communicate with this bigger cloud environment, right? And one of the things we do is that we have this concept of BGP over land where you can exchange all the routing information directly in the cloud. It doesn't have to be hairpins to your on-site or on or cola, whatever. All this happened in the cloud. We learned all those different routes. And as a result of that, people that coming in through the SD-WAN directly could access the resource in the cloud without being taken for a long scenic route, right? Uh, right, right. So that's the first one in terms of option, BTP over LAN. The second one is BTP over GRE. Now, you know, people say, well, why do I want to do GRE? I could just do simple, speech. Why, why, don't I, why do I want to do that? There are times that, let's say your BTP speaker, your, that router you want to do BTP hearing, might sit behind certain network resource. For example, behind a firewall, or even yet deeper into inside your private network, right? And this router, you want this router to exchange route with the cloud. So this is where this come in handy, right? You could have a GRE tunnel from the gate, from the AVX transit to this router that might sit, sit deep inside your environment and you can exchange BGP over that, over that GRE tunnel, right? The other use case is that, you know what? Um, I don't want to do IPsec because IPsec is very process intensive, right? You need a router, big router to do, to support that. In addition to that, a lot of times you might want, you might have to pay extra for licensing, but I need to tunnel that traffic, right? This is another use case. Why you want BGP over GRE, right? Is that GRE is a very low um, band, not bandwidth, but low processing requirement protocol. It's just encapsulating traffic, right? Even a, a lighter router could support that. So that's another reason why some people like doing BGP or GRE. And obviously we have BGP over IPsec for the ones that really want to ensure all their traffic is secure, encrypted, and nobody could actually intercept them and, and yet drop on those traffic. You know, as soon as it leaves the permit, all the way to the VPC, right? So we have this BGP over IPsec. Again, you know, this is a high performance uh, IPsec um, that would 
be able to allow you to use the full bandwidth your your direct connect or that de some dedicated connection. All right. So, any anyway, I do have two questions on this slide. So the first one on the BGP over LAN. Here you are showing the SD WAN gateway. So. Is this feature only applicable for SD-WAN gateway or customers can use any other software gateway or router to connect to the Aviatrix Transit gateways? Yeah, so good question. I only picked this as an example. In fact, if you have, for example, like a CR, virtual CRS or any other virtualized entity that you happen, you want to exchange routing information with um, that sits in the cloud, we can do that. Obviously you need reachability, right? If they sit in the same VPC, that's easy. But if they don't sit in the same VPC, if there's the reachability in the cloud, we, we could establish that BGP uh, peering with those other virtualized um, firewall or, or, or router, if you will, right? Uh, to get the routing information. Uh, this is great because this feature can solve a lot of problems because customers can utilize the unlimited bandwidth. There is no tunneling protocol over here. So this is awesome. So another question I have, like I see multiple private circuits for CSP. Is there any way customer can use either BX, ER, or maybe just a cloud interconnect to access all the CSPs from on-prem? Yeah, that's actually a good question. And, and we come across that, you know, once in a while, as pe mostly when people expand, right? And they don't necessarily want to buy additional dedicated connection. Um, so I, I could definitely understand uh, why you asked that. So I actually, so for example, you know, a lot of the customers, they start off with one cloud, you know, they just said, you know what, I'm starting off, I just want to put a website together so people could buy my product um, or, you know, could see my blog or my video, right? So they start off with one because that's what they, very simple use case. And they might purchase, in this case, a direct connect um, with, AWS, right? And they could be doing BGP over GRE or whatever. But in this case, I put down BGP over GRE, but they could be doing IPsec. But they have one single dedicated connection um, into the cloud environment because they only need one. And a lot of time, you know, as, they, as their business mature, as their needs grows, they actually add in, you know, two or three, four other cloud provider because they might be accessing, you know, Microsoft C60 or whatever construct they have, they, they are active directory, right? That kind of stuff. Um, and they actually could share that con connection. And this is one really powerful use case because, you know, in the past, if you have different cloud, you actually require to have different connection, even though it might be just a VPN connection into those different environments in order to access them. With this, you can actually share that dedicated connection that you already purchased. Um, in this example, we have Azure. You know, this customer might only have one VNet that they, that they need, right? Very low um, requirement, but they want to communicate with it, right? They could actually connect into the AVX transit that has that dedicated AT&T direct connection, and they can use that, right? You might have a 10 gig here, you might have a one gig, it doesn't really matter. But the point is that you, re you use that asset that you already have now to access your Azure environment. Now you preserve that low latency because you're no longer going through an IPsec that you would through the internet. Um, so you get all the benefit in terms of low latency, the speed. Typically, even though you might say, oh, this is a different cloud provider. Typically, in most cases, these different cloud provider has their connection either peering at a single place or they are in literally proximity to one another, their data center. So this is much better in terms of performance than you would have to go through a VPN connection and through internet. Um, or if you have a bigger need, right? You might have another additional aviatric transit that you connect to multiple, um, your, in this case, G, GP, CC, GCP, and again, you can still peer it back to the, the site you have direct connect and share that connection, right? 
this this also bypassed some of the limitations. For example, like you mentioned earlier, Azure and GCP doesn't support BGP over GRE. Well, you could now. You basically circumvent that limitation. We let you do that um, uh, while still accessing all the different cloud provider, right? And going back to that now single control, you know, even though you might have expanded to all these different cloud, you can still see them in one place and control them in one place. Yeah, this makes it really easy to access the multiple CSPs via shared private circuits. But don't you think, Andy, it will introduce some security concerns? How would I yeah, make certainly. Sure that, yeah, so how would I make sure that all of my line of businesses have their own boundaries? Do I need to have the separate firewall pairs for each line of business? Yeah, so again, that's really good, right? You look at this picture, that's a very natural inclination to think that, hey, once I get in, I got the keys to the kingdom, right, so to speak. Um, so yes, traditionally, a lot of our customers rely on buying a lot of firewall in the different you know, individual VC, uh, VPC or VNet or on-prem um, to help guard against those different assets. Um, this is another feature that Aviatric brings to the table from a software defined networking perspective, right? That doesn't exist if you were to using the native construct. Um, this is what we call segmentation. So in this picture, I know it's a little busy here. Uh, in this picture, I have, it's a very colorful picture. I have three color. I have the green, the yellow, and the pink. So imagine if you will, these are the three different segments I have, right? So in this example, I have three different cloud provider, uh, one here on the left, one in the middle, and the last one here on the right. And I have three different type of locations that I need to access it as environment. So I have the ability, and this is what I meant, right? You know, just advertising the route to the cloud. I mean, if you just use the native construct, that's fine, but it doesn't really have a lot of gap. This is one of those gaps that, hey, AV actually, actually helps you have a cohesive environment between the cloud and on-prem. And you can see here as one of the example, let's say on this premise, the, the pink is one of the segments. Let's say this pink segment. A lot of people right now are doing, is moving their asset to the cloud, rehosting. Right. Um, one of the things that's really handy is I could actually task, uh, tag this on-prem in the ping segment, and then one of the VNet or VPC at the same segment. So let's say if I were to move a server that it sits in this on-prem, right? I'm doing rehosting now. I'm doing my migration, my journey to the cloud. I could actually build this construct. So now this ping segment could only you know, as I migrate these resources to the cloud, they're in the same security construct, confine, you know, like garden. And you could build this ahead of time, right? The nice part is that you could actually tag this as pink and you can make sure that nobody else could access the pink because pink could only access pink. And as these, as you move resource to the cloud, the way these other color, right? These other segment access the pink is the same, right? Because they still, segregated, it, they cannot talk to, for example, right? This colo cannot talk to the ping before, as you move to the cloud, they're still separated, right? We provide that seamless way for you to start your cloud journey, to start re-hosting application onto the cloud. Um, again, green here can only talk to the green. And the other thing you might notice is that these segmentation is not confined to a single cloud provider, right? You can see green here is both in the AWS environment and the CGP environment, right? So it's actually split up between AWS, GCP, and your colo, right? So this concept of segmentation actually extend to multiple cloud provide environment as well as your on-premise location that you connecting in and your partner that you want to connect in like a site to cloud connection. We have this concept of site to cloud as well, right? So it's really powerful. So 
you don't even need to buy firewall to do this segmentation. This is done through part of the AVA, aviatric orchestration, right? From the controller, we can do this construct. Um, other component that we also bring to the table without adding additional resource, right? We spoke about that overlapping side earlier. Uh, we allow you, we have the capability to do source NAT, destination NAT, as well as map one-to-one -one or many-to-many -many mapping, right? If you have overlapping CIDR. Um, you, we also support the basic layer for firewalling. If you want to, you know, uh, prevent traffic, examine traffic based on uh, layer three and port, we, we have that built in, capability built in. And the software defined programming, right? It talks so much about, because this is really key, right? Once you have a complex environment, it's really hard to not have to do something manually, right? As you, most of you know that work in the enterprise, you know, we have, oh, you guys have OSPF protocol. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have static route in that environment as well, right? Even though there might be automation, you know, protocol that take care of stuff in this BGP, but there are times that you need additional tool to help you program it. And this is that software defined programming route comes into handy, it lets you, you know, um, do that automatically once you have to uh, define. <clears throat> so all this is managed and owned by you as a customer. All right, so and basically when you wanted to have a communication between the green and the yellow, all you have to do at that point is to just to create some connection policies and uh, voila, right? You can have a connectivity between them. So one more thing which I wanted to ask. So when I'm having an architectural discussion with my customers, the number one complaint they have is that we don't have any visibility in the cloud. Having these segmentations like you were just describing, won't it add like more operational challenges for my customers? Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, normally I would say yes, yeah, especially in the model that a lot of you know people started with, meaning they might have firewall into the different VPC and, and uh, on-prem, right? Um, so what I want to do is I want to actually show you the tool. I have a small um, demo. I could show you how we can give you that visibility and control uh, in terms of um, this segmentation and the stuff that you spoke about. And we can also see how all this software defined route programming works. That would be great. So let me get my screen ready. So this is a topology. So there are a few things that I plan to show you. And this is on the right side is the topology that I have constructed, right? Um, so it has two cloud provider. On the left side is this two, it sits inside AWS. And on the right side here, this is inside GCP. Um, I also have a router that sits outside of that, that simulate, you know, maybe a on-prem location that I will be distributing route via BGP into the environment. And these are the holes that sit inside this VPC in their private um, subnet, right? So there's one here inside this lab subnet, and there's another one here that sits inside the R&D subnet, right? Um, like I said, I would be sending in some um, route via BGP. And one thing to notice that these are not RFC 1918 route, right? Which is important because like I pointed out earlier, because this route, you actually have to program it into the native routing table. So to, to those, the, the holes that's sitting in those uh, subnet knows how to do routing. So that's, the, that's why it's important. Um, and I have some notation here and I'll explain that as I go along. Um, so the first thing is that I wanna show you is that I'm injecting this 251001 route into the topology, okay? And what I did is that um, this route is sent to the, all the cloud provider. And in the case of this uh, VPC, I'm only programming it in the private subnet. Right, and let me just bring up my screen. So I already started this uh, ping and let me show you, uh, I have config. 
So this is the host 10 to 128, 168. This is the host that sits inside the private subnet in here. And you can see that it could reach through the whole infrastructure all the way to this um, router that sits out there. And I'm just gonna do this you know, quickly. If I were to look at the routing table, you can see this route is programmed in the private table. And we said, we mentioned earlier, we're not gonna program this in the public table. See, all this is defined uh, via the aviatric controller that you can define all this. And this route is propagated at R&D, both private and uh, table and the public table, right? If I were to look at the GCP environment, again, let me do a refresh here. You can see this route is propagated into those VPC as well, right? So this is how this is all done via the controller. No user doing this manually, right? That's the important piece. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna inject a second route into the environment, this 251.0.1.0. Uh, so what I'm trying to show you is that this is a route that we don't expect, right? We do not approve this route to be in the environment. And let me just send that route in. I'm gonna enable this interface. All right, and this route is gonna get propagated into the environment. So what happened is that this CIDR has not been approved to be in the environment. Let me just check my email. Oh, I got it already. So what would happen is that I would get an email notification right, it's saying, oh, this gateway, right, Transit VA AWS, receive this CIDR from this location. And you have to approve it in order for this to get propagated. And let me show you that. Let me just show you the routing table first. Again, I have not approved that route yet. You can see none of these tables got um, propagated with that route, that new route. I'm gonna go to my controller and go to that multi-cloud transit approval, go to the gateway that the email told me to you see. Here, that prefix is in a pending state. So I simply, if I look at this, I, okay, this is legitimate. Uh, you know, whoever is propagating this route did not have a typo. This is something I expected. I simply approved it. And I update my environment and the controller would go out there, right? This is that software defined construct. Would go out there into the environment, or I should say in that, um, and program this route to all the necessary route table that you define, right? So let me do a refresh here. Uh, let's see. Sometime it takes a little time. Let's look at this guy. Okay. You can see it here already, 251.0.1.0, right? So this is the route from before. This is uh, the, two, the route that got propagated and programmed. And here in AWS, um, sticking a little bit today. Well, we can come back to this a little later. But you, the, the idea is that you have to approve it in order for this route to get programmed. And you saw that being programmed in the GCP environment. So sometimes these API and the environment takes a little bit of time. Now, I got a third route that I'm gonna propagate into the network, this 251.02 network. And I only specified this to program in the, GCP, uh, in the AWS environment. Again, uh, let me start advertising this route by enabling the interface. Okay, sending stuff. Now this route, I don't need to approve because originally I approved it already. So I already know to anticipate this route to be in the topology. So what happens is that uh, this route get propagated here and I already defined that this route, I only want to send to AWS, but not uh, GCP, right? So let's see if this gets updated. Interesting, why? <clears throat> Let me do this. Route table, here we go. You can see just API. See that route that I was gonna show you earlier is now here. 
this new one, the one I just sent in, is now here in AWS. Uh, again, it's not in the public route table because I didn't want that to be updated. It's in the R&D environment, right? Both R&D uh, VPC. Now let's look at GCP now. Let me do a refresh. Let me try a few refresh. So you see that that route is not propagated, has not been programmed in the GCP environment, right? This is what I meant by, you know, using the aviatric software defined, you know, networking to augment the BGP protocol. Yes, you, we are doing BGP to exchange a route at the most basic level, but that is really the first step, right, in the overall networking environment, right? Um, so now, all this, you see that how much clicking I have to do, right? I have to go through all these, you know, different pages to show you the routing table. What is very nice in Aviatric is that we actually, as the tool, to the co-pilot, a more very operational centric tool to help your operation to look at some of these things, right? Um, we have this call, uh, for example, cloud route. Um, in here, you can see where all the route this is not, uh, oh, this is not, it is a down one. Um, you can see the routing information in one place, right? This is from the Aviatric Gateway point of view. We have it from the native construct point of view. We have it on site to cloud, meaning these external connections that you have and the BTP protocol. So for example, my Austin, right? Uh, here. Right, sending route into the environment. And you can see it tells you what the AS, what it looks like pictorially, right? What the ASN number is on the router as well as on the gateway uh, direction. You can see what routes are learned, you know, by that Austin. Uh, okay, let me see. Oh, this is the gateway, the route learned by the gateway from the Austin router. Right, you also could see what route is advertised by the gateway to the Austin router. So all that information you can see in one place. Now the nice part is that even if you were to look at a certain route, right? Let's say here, uh, it would tell you which location have this routing route exist, right? And if you go in there, it actually highlights it for you, right? And let's say if I were to look at that too, right? It tells you, see two is only in AWS. So it gives you a very easy way to see where the routing is without having to go through all those clicking, signing on in AWS, signing on GCP and whatever else you have, right? But we, so that's one. Um, we mentioned about, you know, troubleshooting if somebody, something doesn't work and who do they call, right? They call the support desk. And we talk about that in the beginning. And let me show you this app IQ, right? It's a way for you to see what's going on in terms of, hey, if somebody says certain things doesn't work, what can this help? So let's say I have two hosts here, right? This host on the left in lab, and then this host on the right in R&D. Let's say somebody say, I, you know, the two of them cannot talk, you know, I, I cannot get from one to the other. Okay, so I start with the, let's say R&D holes and the holes in here. So let's just say I want to just do a simple ping first and see if ping could get through, okay? So I specify where I want to start from, where I want the destination is, what protocol is you can see, in this case, ICMP, and then the system would go out there and hold those different assets, you know, in terms of security group and ver verify whether I can get through. So you can see here, let me move this a little bit. So this is a picture from R&D to lab. And you can see there's a pictorial view. It tells you all the latency, what path exists, what path is available to them uh, in blue. Um, what VPC, you know, in this case, uh, uh, Amazon is there, 
right? It gives you all this information. But the most important part is I want to point out is that I don't have any data in terms of transmit receive only because they have not been spin up that long. But the most important part is that it gives you this consolidated all this information from network access control list, route table, security group, right? Um, and it tells you which policy did it use to match that condition. So you can see everything is green here. You know that those two holes could reach one another. Now, this is good, right? I mean, you can see everything is green, but what does it look like when things doesn't work? So let's say, for example, I want to see if Telnet works, right? I put it in here. And again, it goes out there, gather all the information in terms of security group, um, routing table, network control list. And it, again, it goes through all that checks again. So if somebody updates something, it would find it. And it gives you this picture, okay, what path to it. So the path doesn't change, obviously, right? Uh, latency, I doubt it changed too much. And we just keep scrolling down. Okay, uh, NACO is good. Route table is good, it has route, all right? Okay, this security group is good. Um, continue now to the destination side, right? The, the spoke uh, R&D is good. Route table, all right, this looks good. Oh, you know what? The network access control list is blocking me. It identifies for you why Telnet was not working. In this case, I have a deny rule for the TCP protocol for 23. Oh, that's Telnet. That's why it didn't work, right? Oh, the rest are good. Okay, that's good. Now, I just need to go in and fix this, right? Um, we also have this hyperlink here. You go in, you click on it. It will take you to that resource. And you can see here, oh, Telnet is denied, right? You can quickly fix that, right? Without clicking on the different paint within the AWS environment or what have you, right? Um, a lot of times you don't even have access to the host as a network administrator. Those could be the host that belong to the application owner. You might not have access to those to actually do a ping or telnet to test, right? So this helps you, you know, um, narrow down what the problem is, right? Um, so without going, digging all over the place. One also very important feature that we also included in here is this topology replay, right? You see me advertising route into the environment. A lot of time when your user, you know, approach you and say, yeah, certain things doesn't work. A lot of time it's historical, meaning somebody did something maybe an hour ago, maybe a day ago, maybe last week, right? But what, what was that change, right? You, you might not know when was that change, or what was that change, right? You might be able to find out what was that change, but you don't know when it happened, right? So you want to find out what's going on. So if you go into Copilot with this topology, uh, topology re replay, and so by default, it just takes me to the most current one. You can see that I inject this route, right? At this time into the environment. Oh, okay. I injected this route from Austin, you know, uh, my Austin office, and this is the, ASN number, right? What got affected? So you could actually tell um, what got changed and when it got changed. So if I were to look at another one, um, this is some sometime earlier. I have no idea what this is, but um, just randomly kicking, clicking something. And it tells you, oh, this gateway from down to up, okay. You know, so, and you know when that change happened. This is April 8th, quite a long time ago, right? So it gives you this ability to answer some of those questions. It's like, oh, what changed? When did that happen? Now, with those information, you can probably narrow it down. Oh, maybe that was during a maintenance window. We accidentally shut down something. Okay, that's what it was, right? It really, really helped with the day two part, right? The day one part we talk about, right? With the BGP routing, with building that, you know, networking hybrid cloud on-prem environment but this also gives you the ability to operate from day two 
and on, right? So very powerful tools. And let me just clean up this here. So with this, um, I conclude the demo portion of the presentation. All right, so this is really great, Andy. And thanks for showing us the visibility aspect of Aviatrix platform. And also, you know, having this deep dive session on BGP. I'm pretty sure it would help the network engineers and the architects. So if you guys have any questions, then please uh, send it through the chat so we can answer the questions live. Well, thank you, Saad. Uh, thank you for having me again and looking forward to our next session. <laughs>